In studying the book of Revelation, there are a few times that, are, that will be more rewarding than those times when we can actually make sense of what he's saying by having explicit cross-reference in the scriptures elsewhere so that we can actually make sense unmistakably of certain portions. There are many portions that probably, after all of our best efforts, we will still have some uh, remaining questions unanswered about that will probably be inevitable but there are some portions that are quite unmistakable when you actually see the other parts of the scripture that are alluded to and see how they're being woven together in the book of Revelation we were looking at the breaking of the seven seals of the book the book I believe is the sentence upon apostate Jerusalem for the bloodshed of all the prophets and the saints from the time of Abel down to Zechariah, and then uh, they crucified Jesus and persecuted the disciples. So this, this career of persecution continued even after the time of Christ, as Jesus said it would. Jesus said to them, I will send you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you'll persecute from city to city, some of them you'll kill, some of them you'll uh, drive out of town, and so forth. And so Jesus did send, and we find in chapter 6, when the fifth seal was broken, that we saw the martyrs in heaven under the altar saying, How long, O Lord, before you judge and avenge our blood upon those who dwell in the land? And there was then, with the sixth seal, this dramatic picture, which looked like the end of the world. The sun was dark, the moon was dark. Uh, the stars fell from heaven, the, the, the heavens were rolled up like a scroll, uh, the stars fell like figs from a fig tree, and so forth. Every mountain and every island was removed, and, and uh, people hid in caves, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, I was saying at the end of our last session that this question, who is able to stand, is directly quoted from Malachi, chapter 3, and uh, verse 2, which was a prophecy of the coming of Christ the first time after John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist is mentioned in Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1, as the messenger that is sent before the face of the Messiah. The Messiah is referred to as the messenger of the covenant. And... It says, he will suddenly come to his temple, but who may abide his coming? And this is making it very clear that the coming of Christ to his temple is not a reference to some uh, light matter. It's not a matter, it's not even something like Jesus driving the livestock out of the temple with a whip. There were very few really affected by that. As far as we know, no human beings ever were threatened by Jesus even in that incident, he drove the animals out. He didn't have to do anything to the people. They followed their prophets. And so, that coming to the temple, of which it is said, who will be able to endure it? Who will be able to stand it? Is, I believe, the coming of Christ in judgment in AD 70 to the temple, where the temple actually was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed, and there was a great bloodshed. Uh, a great holocaust, unfortunately, that was, it was, I mean, God weeps over that. Jesus wept over Jerusalem when he knew that this was going to have to happen. And who did stand? Who did survive that? Well, the question is asked at the end of chapter 6, and it is answered at the beginning of chapter 7. Here we read, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal, the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 
144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Uh, 12, uh, excuse me, of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Now, this is the first half of the chapter. The second half takes another direction. But here we see 144,000 people sealed with the seal of God on their forehead. We are told that the four winds of the earth, the angels uh, holding back the four winds of the earth, were told to not allow the winds to blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. And it says in verse 3, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So what's the purpose of this sealing? It is so that when the judgment does come, they may be preserved. We see this actually stated uh, when the uh, fifth uh, trumpet sounds, something we're going to be seeing soon. Uh, when the fifth trumpet sounds, in chapter 9, these locusts come out of the bottomless pit. And in verse 4, chapter 9, verse 4, it says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So just as when God sent his plagues upon Egypt, the plagues afflicted God's enemies, the Egyptians, but did not afflict the Hebrews, who were among them because they were God's people. So also when God sends the plagues in Revelation, those who have the seal of God on their forehead are preserved. And God does not, in this vision, does not even allow the judgments to begin. Does not allow the earth or the sea or the trees to be even affected. Doesn't even let the wind blow upon them until he has first identified and sealed those that will be protected from this judgment. Now, actually, when the judgment does begin and the trumpets begin to sound, we'll see that the trees and the earth and the sea are all affected. But they are not to be harmed until this sealing. Now, interesting, it doesn't say, do not harm the earth, the sea, and the trees until I've removed my people from the earth. As, for example, if there was a pre-tribulation rapture. But rather, until I put my seal on them, and then when the judgments come, those who have the seal are preserved. Now, this imagery of sealing the elect, sealing the remnant in Jerusalem before the fall of Jerusalem has its precedent in Ezekiel, as many things in, in Revelation do. I think I mentioned, I read a, an article recently where a man said he thought that the book of Ezekiel provided the outline for the book of Revelation, that Revelation followed Ezekiel's outline. I have not been able to be do such a sophisticated analysis to see that to be so. But I have seen, of course, as everyone does, that Ezekiel's imagery and ideas are rebirthed in Revelation. And interestingly, of course, Ezekiel's time was the time where Jerusalem was about to be destroyed. Actually, Ezekiel lived through the destruction of Jerusalem. He was in Babylon, and about the first half of his ministry was before Jerusalem fell. And the second half was afterward. And so we have prophecies in Ezekiel from both before and after. But in the part before Jerusalem fell, we have this vision in chapter 9 of Ezekiel. Let me uh, turn your attention to it. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city, this means Jerusalem, draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. These that had charge over the city were apparently angelic beings, maybe even demonic beings, it's hard to know. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper pool, upper gate, excuse me, which faces the north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with a linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Then we have the, the glory of the Lord appearing there. And in verse 4 it says, The Lord said to the man with the inkhorn, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry 
over all the abominations that are done in it. In other words, all the men who are, who are sympathetic with God, who, who uh, have the same attitude God has about the abominations that are done in the city. So this is the faithful remnant in the city. They receive a mark on their forehead. And in verse 5, it says, To the others, he said, in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and their children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Now, we see then that when Jerusalem was to be destroyed, Ezekiel had this vision. It was not literal. It was figurative. The people of Jerusalem were not killed by six angels with battle axes. They were killed by Babylonians who broke in. The, the actual judgment came in the form of armies invading. But symbolically, it was as if God was sending angels in to execute those who were ripe for execution, those who, were, who had done things worthy of death, and those who he could no longer tolerate in Jerusalem. And yet, before he did so, before he sent the, Jerusalem, the judgment on Jerusalem, he marked on the foreheads those who were his remnant there. And John is, of course, obviously imitating, or I mean, the, the vision that God gives John is imitating this vision, in some respects, in Ezekiel. Jerusalem is about to be destroyed, but God identifies, first of all, his remnant. After all, it was asked, who will be able to stand when this judgment falls? Well, there will be some, and not a few, actually, because their number is said to be 144,000. Now, the 144,000 are said to be 12,000 from every tribe of Israel. However, the listing of the tribes is rather creative. For example, the tribe of Manasseh is mentioned in verse 6, and so is the tribe of Joseph in verse 8. Now, Joseph was divided into two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. So the tribe of Judah, Joseph would actually include the tribe of Manasseh, but we have them listed separately. No doubt the tribe of Joseph is intended to convey Ephraim. So we'd have Ephraim and Manasseh. But there's a problem. Whenever you include Ephraim and Manasseh as complete tribes in a list, you, you actually end up with 13 tribes. So to keep the number at 12, someone has to be left out. In the Bible, this is commonly done. Ephraim and Manasseh are often listed in the tribal lists, but in order to keep the list at 12, sometimes some tribe or another is omitted. Very often it's Levi that's omitted because the Levites were a separate tribe set aside for other matters. And so you have the 12 omitting Levi, but in this case Levi is included. The tribe that is missing is the tribe of Dan. And uh, there have been many people trying to explain why the tribe of Dan is omitted. Some people say it's because the tribe of Dan, according to the book of Judges, was the first tribe to get involved in idolatry after the settlement of the land of Canaan. Others have said that uh, Dan is going to be the tribe from which the Antichrist will come, and therefore their, uh, their tribe is omitted from this list of those who are saved. Actually, one of the church fathers suggested that. However, it's hard to know where in the world he got that. There's no reference in the Bible to Antichrist coming from the tribe of Dan. And so it seems to have been an entire fabrication, just apparently at one desperate attempt to explain why Dan isn't mentioned. Maybe, maybe the Antichrist is coming from that tribe, and that explains it. Well, it might explain it, but it doesn't explain it with any credibility or authority. The truth is we're not given any reason why that's obvious. It may be that Dan was more idolatrous than other tribes, or it may simply be that Revelation is not concerned with precision of fact as much as impression. And in order to keep the tribes at 12, to indicate from the whole nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, someone had to be left out. Dan just happened to get the axe. And it may be not significant. It may be that any other tribe could have been left out instead and it wouldn't have been any different. We, we need to have 12 here. And the, the number 12,000 from each tribe is almost certainly, uh, you know, symbolic. There are people who believe the 144,000 will be a literal 144,000 people in the future. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, believe 
there are literally 144,000 in their ranks who are called the anointed ones, the ones who will be in heaven, where the other Jehovah's Witnesses will not. They will be in the new earth. Uh, dispensationalists believe that during the tribulation, after the church has been taken out, that there will be 144,000 Jews who are converted, who become very evangelistic. And according to some uh, dispensationalists, the 144,000 will be very effective during the tribulation in turning people to Christ. People like Hal Lindsey and, and people like that who became famous for their dispensational books have said that you should try to picture the 144,000 as, as this number of Jewish Billy Grahams going about the world, converting more people in seven years of tribulation than the church converted in 2,000 years. Now, these are all very fanciful suggestions. There's nothing here about the 144,000 evangelizing anybody. There are, of course, after this, in the same chapter, a description of an innumerable company of people from every tribe and tongue who are saved, but it doesn't say that the 144,000 had a particular impact on them or influence upon them. We simply have two groups of people mentioned. The 144,000 are mentioned one other place in the Bible, and that is in Revelation 14. And turning there, we actually get more information about them than we do in the longer section in chapter 7. We have only a few verses about them in chapter 14, <laughs> verses 1 through 5. And it's, uh, although it's uh, about a third as long a portion, I'm sorry, about half as long a portion, uh, it actually has more information than chapter 7 has about them. And so these two passages are all we have to identify who we're talking about here. In Revelation 14, 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So the mark that was on their forehead apparently is now morphed into the father's name on their foreheads, like a brand of ownership on a slave. I would point out to you that this is immediately after the verse that talks about people who have the mark and the name of the beast on their foreheads in chapter uh, 13, the last verses of chapter 13 talk about people who are compromised and who uh, are actually damned receiving the mark of the beast on their forehead. But now we have the Christians, the believers, have their father's name on their foreheads. And it says in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the, loud, the sound of a harpist saying... Excuse me, I'm not reading very well. Playing their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the land or the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, here we have quite a list of identifiers of these people. The first of them is that they are virgins and have not defiled themselves with women. I believe that the term have not defiled themselves with women explains what is meant by virgins. They're not literal virgins. After all, a married man is not a virgin, but he hasn't defiled himself by being married. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled in Hebrews chapter 13. Marriage bed is not a defiling thing. And so these people are no doubt virginal or pure in the sense that they have not defiled themselves with the harlot who is so prominent in the later chapters of Revelation. They're not part of that system. The harlot is the Babylon, the mother of harlots, the mother of prostitutes. These people, the 144,000, have not participated with that uh, group. And I think that's what's meant when it says they're virgins. They're not literal virgins. If they were literal virgins, if one had to decide, would decide that in order to be a part of this group and to be saved, you have to be a real virgin, that would strongly suggest that getting married would be wrong. And Paul said to Timothy that people would teach doctrines of demons forbidding to marry. Uh, forbidding to marry is a doctrine of demons, Paul said, but it would be a necessary doctrine. If you had to be a virgin to be saved, you couldn't be married. 
And so, if they were literal virgins, you'd be somewhat compelled to forbid marriage, and therefore participate in doctrines that Paul refers to as demonic. This is figurative, just like the great harlot is figurative. There's compromise that many have been involved in. Uh, Ill, uh, unfaithfulness to God, covenant breaking. These aren't among those who have been doing that. They're faithful. They're, they're undefiled. It says these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now the Lamb, of course, is Jesus, and therefore those who follow Him are His followers, His disciples. They are Jewish, we know that from chapter 7. Now we know they're Christians, they're Jewish Christians. They're Jewish disciples of Jesus, and they've kept themselves pure. They're not part of the generality of those who have defiled themselves with the harlot. It says in, next, they were redeemed from among men. Well, that could refer to any kind of Christians. All Christians have been redeemed by Christ among men, so that's not giving us more information. But this might help. Being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. These are Jewish Christians who are said to be the first fruits unto God from the twelve tribes. Let me show you something interesting. In uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 1. James 1 1 says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. So the people he's writing to are Jewish from the twelve tribes. However, he says in verse 2, my brethren, I mean chapter 2, verse 2, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1. James 2, 1. It says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. So he assumes that they're holding the faith of Christ. He says, don't do so with partiality. And it says in, in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2, you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts do not they blaspheme the noble name by which you're called? Obviously a reference to Christ's name. The readers are Christians. They hold the faith of Jesus Christ. They're Jewish from the 12 tribes. Now look what he says to them in chapter 1, verse 18. He says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Who? Jewish Christians from the 12 tribes, contemporary with James, first century. First century Jewish Christians. They are the first fruits. Understandably, when God began to harvest souls, when he began to bring in uh, the net, harvest the grain and get rid of the chaff, uh, the Jews were the first from whom a remnant was was taken. The disciples were all Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. The disciples were all Jewish. The first many thousands of converts were Jewish. We know in Acts that there were 3,000 Jewish converts on the day of Pentecost. Then a few days later there were 5,000 men and not including women and children in the church. So the church had grown to probably, you know, 15, 20,000 at that time. We do not receive any further numbers except in many cases it says the church continued to grow. We don't know how many Jewish believers there were in the Jerusalem church before Gentiles were included in the church. But initially, it was all Jews. All of our original brothers and sisters were Jewish. They were the remnant in the first century, the ones who escaped the Holocaust of 70 AD. They were the first fruits unto God. The rest of us have been harvested in, since then. And so, it's pretty easy to identify the 144,000. They're the first fruits. They're Jews in the first century. They are uh, believers. And if you look at Revelation 14, 5, it says, In their mouth was found no guile. Do you remember what Jesus said about Nathaniel? In John chapter 1, when he saw Nathaniel coming to him, he said, There's an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. It says of Jesus in Isaiah 53, there was no guile found in his mouth. What's guile? Guile is simply duplicity, dishonesty, hypocrisy, pretension. 
You see, when Jesus came to Israel, he found that the main religious leaders were very pretentious, hypocritical. That's the main thing he said in evaluating them. You're hypocrites. But there were some in Israel who were not hypocrites. There were genuine, guileless Jews. Nathaniel was one of them. And Jesus said, here comes a true Israelite, one in whom is no guile. Now these ones are like Nathaniel. Disciples, Jewish disciples in whom is no guile. They're part of the, the, the honest and faithful remnant in Israel. And it says they are without fault before the throne of God in Revelation 14, 5. So we've gotten, I think, enough to be able to identify who we're talking about here. We're talking about that Jewish church in Jerusalem, the first Christians, the first fruits, the original converts of the apostles. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones who were like those in Ezekiel's day, who were not of the same spirit of the wicked and the apostate. They were sighing and crying over the abominations done in Jerusalem, like those in Ezekiel's day who received the mark on their forehead and who were preserved when the judgment came. So also, when chapter 6 ends with the question, who will be able to stand? The answer is, these people will, the ones who have the mark of God on their foreheads. Who are they? They are the Christians in the first century in Jerusalem, who did in fact escape. I've mentioned this before, but I have with me the quote from the historian Eusebius. He wrote around 325 A.D., and uh, he wrote a church history. And when he's writing about A.D. 70 and about the, you know, the Roman invasion of Jerusalem, he wrote these words, quote, The whole body, however, of the church at Jerusalem, having been commanded by a divine revelation given to men of approved piety there before the war, removed from the city and dwelt at a certain town beyond the Jordan called Pella. The whole Christian church escaped this holocaust. They were residents of Jerusalem, so they would ordinarily have been caught in the siege like everybody else and would have suffered all the deprivations and the crimes and the pestilence and so forth. But they were warned by divine revelation to escape, and they did escape. And so this is God marking his own before he brings the judgment down and he brings them out to a place of safety. And so... The judgments of which we are about to read, especially when the trumpets begin to blow, do not begin until God has made sure he knows who his own are, has identified them, and they are the ones who, when the judgments come, uh, the judgments bypass them and do not uh, harm them. Now, after the 144,000 <coughs> in Revelation 7, verse 9, it says, After these things... I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worship God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. There happen to be seven attributes mentioned here. Verse 13, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. That's what Ezekiel said when he saw the dry bones. And the angel said, Can these bones live, Ezekiel? <laughs> Ezekiel thought, Hmm. You tell me. Is this a trick question? <laughs> you know? And he said, Sir, you know. You're going to have to answer me. And, the, and then, of course, he, gave, he was given an answer. And John, responding as Ezekiel did, just said, Sir, you know. I don't know who these people are. You do. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Now that's interesting. But in the Greek it's present tense. Those who are coming out of the great tribulation. In John's day, these people were coming out of the great tribulation. 
and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know this is symbolic because blood is not a whitening agent. But it's talking about cleansing their conscience and their record and their character by the blood of Christ, which is symbolic to refer to as their robes. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor the heat. For the Lamb, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. So these uh, details are simply telling what apparently these people who... It would seem they died because they're seen in heaven. Uh, when they've gone to heaven, this is what is true of them. They, they don't have any more discomfort. They don't ever hunger or thirst again. They are cared for by Jesus like a shepherd takes care of his sheep, his lambs. And they spend their time worshiping God in the temple. Now this would be, uh, of course, what we would call the uh, intermediate state. Sometimes we think of heaven as the place where we're going to spend eternity. And we read these pictures of heaven and say, is that what it's going to be like up there? And actually this is all very symbolic, of course. The language is... Uh, impressionistic. But the point is, this isn't the eternal state. This is where people are gone when they die. There's still a judgment to come. There's still a lake of fire for some and a new heavens, new earth for others. Heaven is not where we live forever. Heaven is where we go to be with Jesus until he leaves there. And he will leave there when he comes back here. And so when Jesus comes back, those who have died with Christ, he will bring with him. And there will be a new heavens, new earth. So this description is of apparently of people who have died. Uh, it says they have come up out of the great tribulation. It doesn't say they've died, but they appear to be in heaven. And because they're in heaven, we have to assume their life is over. They've made it through. Now, were they martyred? Maybe. We don't know. If there's great tribulation, it's a good chance that a fair number of them died through martyrdom. But it doesn't specify that. What it does say is that they have been faithful and the most important thing that is said about them is that there was a great multitude of them, which no one could number, in verse 9, from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Now, some commentators feel that when we read about the 144,000 in the first nine verses of this chapter, that we are actually uh, reading a, 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 of the spiritual Israel. Actually, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are among those who would say so. The 144,000, though it's said that there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, they say, well, this is spiritual. And, of course, we know that there are times when Israel is spiritual in the Bible. There are evangelical commentators who believe that the 144,000 represent the church militant on earth. And the people we just read about in heaven are the church victorious in heaven. That at any given time, part of the church is still on earth, fighting the battles, and another part has already died and gone on to heaven, and that John has seen both. And that the 144,000 are not necessarily really Jewish, they're just the spiritual Israel. However, I personally believe that John labors to tell us that the first group are in fact Jewish, and contrasts them with the second group in that very respect. There are two contrasts between these groups that tell us that they're not just different ways of looking at the same people. One is that 144,000 are numbered. And he specifically says in verse 4, I heard their number. But of the second group in verse 9, it says no one could number. This is an immense group that nobody can number. It's an innumerable company as opposed to the 144,000, which is a large company, but not too large to number. Still, it's the smaller portion of the body of Christ. The Jewish converts are, are many in number. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish people have been saved, maybe millions. But they're still in the minority. And so the 144,000 are Jewish people, and their number is given. The people from all the other rest of the world, of course, with many other nations participating, outnumber them by a factor of who knows how much. They're numerous. You can't count them. But the other thing that is different is that while the 144,000 John labors to emphasize they're Jewish. There's 12,000 from this tribe. There's 12,000 from that tribe. And even though I don't think those are literal numbers, it's, it's definitely trying to say these are people from the 12 tribes. 
Whereas the second group, which is not only more in number uh, and innumerable, but it's also ethnically more diverse because verse 9 says this second group are from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. So the contrast between the first group in the first eight verses and the group in the latter eight verses uh, could not be greater. The first group is numerable. The second group innumerable. The first group are Jews. The second group are Gentiles, or at least people from all nations could include Jews, but the point is that the 144,000 are the first fruits of this group. But John has shown that not only will there be some who survive this great terrible holocaust of 70 AD, which is what brought these people to our attention in the first place, the question about that, but not only will they survive, but there will be many, many more besides them that will wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb and be white and be worshiping God forever alongside the Jewish believers. So you've got Jews and Gentiles coming in and that of course is pretty standard for the, for the stories that, that talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. They often talk about the destruction of Jerusalem and then they talk about the Gentile evangelism. Actually in history Gentiles were widely evangelized before Jerusalem fell. It, Paul's entire ministry was before the fall of Jerusalem and yet he evangelized Gentiles all over Western Europe but but nonetheless when Jerusalem was had fallen then the entire church mission was international there wasn't any center in Jerusalem anymore it was now all the nations that was the venue for the church's activities and so we have this uh, eventually innumerable people coming out now these people are coming up out of the Great Tribulation what does that mean does that mean that they actually are people who died in the midst of the tribulation? Does it mean they have, they have come to heaven as a result of the great tribulation? That is because this tribulation came on the Jews in, in 70 AD, the gospel went out more far and wide, and these people, are, their conversion was a result of that. Does it suggest maybe that the great tribulation is long? And maybe is the entire period from the beginning of the Jewish war until the end of the age. It is possible to see it that way. I'll tell you why. Because if you compare Matthew 24, which is the only other place that mentions the Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, 21. Jesus said, then there shall be great tribulation, such as never was since the world began, nor ever shall be. In the New Testament, that's the only place... The Great Tribulation is mentioned besides the verse we read here in chapter 7, verse 14. But in Luke's parallel, in Luke chapter 21, instead of saying the Great Tribulation, Luke has a paraphrase of it. And this is the paraphrase. Where Matthew 24, 21 says there shall be Great Tribulation, Luke 21, verses 23 and 24 expand it out. They don't just say there'll be great tribulation, but here's what Luke says. Verse 23, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Now, Matthew says that too, but then he says, for then, for then there shall be great tribulation. But Luke says, for there will be great distress in the land, that's in the land of Israel, and wrath upon this people, this people would be his own people, the Jews, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, they will be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, Matthew 24 doesn't mention the times of the Gentiles or Jerusalem being trampled by the Gentiles. It just mentions there will be great tribulation coming on. But in Luke makes it clear that this tribulation is, involves the trampling of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. And this goes on for how long? Not seven years, not three and a half years but until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In other words, from 70 AD to the end of the world, what God is drawing in the Gentiles, he brought in the first fruits before 70 AD, and after 70 AD, he's, the, the harvest is somewhat more general. And the harvest goes on until they're all harvested in, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, as Paul put it in Romans 11:25. Here, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled appears to be, now it doesn't say it in unmistakable terms, but it, the sound of the passage in Luke sounds like the times of the Gentiles 
are coextensive with the great tribulation or the time of distress that Jerusalem is being trampled by the Gentiles. And by most accounts, although the term times of the Gentiles is admittedly ambiguous, most scholars believe the times of the Gentiles means the, the age of the church, the time during which the, the Gentiles are being evangelized. Now, if that is coextensive with the tribulation, then we're making a mistake to think of the tribulation as being restricted to the three and a half years of Jewish war, or, or even in the future, a seven-year tribulation, or anything like that, as some people think of it. But the tribulation is the whole time that Jerusalem is trampled, the whole time that the Jews are in distress. And they have been, terribly so, under distress for the whole time since then. Not equally in all places and at all times, but from time to time and place to place, very much so. And so one could argue that the tribulation began in the Jewish war and has not ended yet. And it will go on until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's at least one way to understand the juxtaposition of Matthew 24's reference to the Great Tribulation with Luke 21's description of it. If that is true, then the Gentiles in Revelation 7 who are coming up out of the Great Tribulation are coming up out of the entire age of the church. These are Christians living and dying faithfully. Some of them as martyrs, perhaps some of them not. They're not said to be martyred, but they are dead. They've lived their lives for Christ, and now they're in heaven. And therefore, this could simply represent the number of Gentiles who are saved totally. But the Jewish remnant is saved first. Paul said that the gospel is to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks. Whenever Paul went even to Gentile cities, he preached first in the synagogues to the Jews to get whatever remnant there was of them into the church, and then he'd go to the Gentiles. But we know that historically, in the broad scale, the church was first planted and grew in Jerusalem for many years before any Gentiles were evangelized. So the first fruits were the Jews saved out of Jerusalem and out of the Jew Jewish community worldwide. And they did survive when the Jewish state went down. But, but uh, Gentiles in much larger numbers eventually come in. Well, let's look at chapter 8 then. In chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. Many have interpreted this in different ways. Uh, it seems very possible that the silence in heaven is the cessation of the cries of the martyrs who were shouting with a loud voice, How long, O Lord? before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth in chapter 6 and verse 10. They were crying with a loud voice. Heaven was rather uh, noisy with this unredressed wrong that's being complained about. But now that wrong is being redressed. Now the judgment has begun, if not been completed. It's hard to know whether in the sixth seal we're supposed to see the end of the cycle. And we'll now see another cycle which parallels it. That's how many people understand it. Others feel that the seven trumpets we're about to encounter uh, are somewhat contained in the seventh seal. And when the seventh seal is broken, then, then, uh, then new disasters come. It's hard to know whether, whether the seals and the trumpets are parallel to each other or sequential to each other. But it doesn't really matter. The point is that they are all giving different impressions and, and uh, aspects of the judgment that's coming upon uh, Jerusalem. And we'll see that this is so as we look at these one by one. But the silence in heaven could mean that the martyrs are no longer crying out, How long, O Lord, before you do that? Because he's doing it. And so the, heaven's not noisy at the moment. It's silent for a little while. Others feel that this silence being only for a half hour is a pregnant silence like a calm before the storm. There's greater judgments about to be described and uh, before just there's a dramatic silence to more or less call attention to the awesomeness of the moment. In any case, after this half hour of silence, in verse 2 it says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, 
And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound and were about to see it. Now, as with the seven sealed book, before we actually see seals broken, we see a heavenly vision. It was in chapters 4 and 5 where John was caught up into heaven and he saw the throne and the throne attendants and he saw the book in the hand, the scroll in the hand of him on the throne and then the question, who, has, who can break these seals? And then Jesus shows up and then there's all this worship. That heavenly vision sets the stage for the seven seals being broken. Now, as we're about to hear the seven trumpets sound, there's a heavenly vision to set the stage for that. It's more or less explanatory of what's going to happen. Now, the seven trumpets call to mind Jericho. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 4, God told Israel that when they would go against Jericho, they would have seven priests with seven trumpets. And they'd march around the city one time a day for seven days. But on the seventh day, they'd march around seven times. And on the seventh time, the priests would blow the seven trumpets. And what would happen? The walls would come down. Jud the judgment on Jericho would be complete. So... The sounding of seven trumpets for judgment, I think, deliberately calls to mind the story of Jericho. And if the, if the recipient of God's judgments here is, in fact, Jerusalem, then Jerusalem is being likened to Jericho, just as Jerusalem is likened to Sodom and Egypt and Babylon in other parts of the book. So that many pagan nations and the judgment upon them in the Old Testament provide the imagery for the judgment on Jerusalem, which has become another Sodom, another Egypt, another Babylon, another Jericho. Jericho was the first Canaanite city that Israel had to conquer when they came into the land. Like Sodom, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a city of Canaan, though Sodom was destroyed by direct intervention by God before Joshua's time. Joshua and his people had to conquer the other Canaanite cities, and they were very corrupt. Very corrupt cities. And God supernaturally caused the walls to fall down when the trumpets sounded and the people shouted. And this, no doubt, is imagery that's supposed to remind us of that. We're now seeing another Jericho about to fall. And uh, before the trumpets sound, we, we see the angels appear at the trumpets. And in verse 6, they get ready to sound. But in between their appearance in verse 2 and their preparation of sound in verse 6 we have this little drama where an angel is carrying an incense burner and he offers incense before the Lord with the prayers of the saints. Now it's interesting that the incense was mixed with the prayers of the saints and, and the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God in the smoke so that the prayers of the saints were offered with the, with the favorable aroma that's pleasing to God. What's strange about that is that in chapter 5 and verse 8, we had similar imagery, but slightly different in a significant way. In chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So these bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints. And it's the twenty-four elders and the, and the uh, four living creatures that have them in chapter 5, verse 8. But here, an angel has one censer and is offering incense with the prayers of the saints. Um, I don't know why the change in the metaphor, but in any case, both 5, 8 and this passage in chapter 8, verses 3 through 5, tell us that the prayers of the saints are presented to God's nostrils as a sweet-smelling aroma. These prayers are, you know, it's not literal, but it's pictured as if the prayers of the saints have been collected in heaven, and they've all, they're all being presented to God at one time. What prayers? Well, the result is that the same incense burner that sent the incense and prayers up 
is taken coals from the altar in the same burner, and those coals are cast on the earth, and fire then comes on the earth, and earthquakes and lightnings and thunders. Uh, these are things, of course, that are just images of judgment in general. But the interesting thing is the judgment comes from the same incense burner that offered the prayers, which is no doubt intended to suggest a connection between the prayers and the results. These were prayers like those of the martyrs on the altar. How long before you avenge our blood on those who dwell in the land? Those prayers are offered up to God, and the same agent that sends the prayers up sends down the judgment in response to the prayers. There's this, an uncomfortable reality in Scripture that uh, it's uncomfortable for us that there is a legitimacy assumed in both the Old and the New Testament of praying for judgment on the wicked. Now we say, but we're supposed to love our enemies and bless those who curse us. Well, that is true. That we are not to bear any personal grudge toward anyone, even if they harm us. But there's more than just us as individuals. There's the work of God. There is the kingdom of God. And those that oppose and would destroy the work of the kingdom of God, part of our warfare, apparently, is praying against them. Uh, if you look at Titus, or no, uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.16, Paul says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. This was his friends when he stood before Nero on trial for his life. Everyone was afraid to stand with him. All his friends forsook him. A bunch of cowards. But he bears them no malice. He says, may it not be charged against them. It's a little like Stephen saying, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. Or like Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. These people who basically betrayed Paul, he wishes no malice. He wishes no ill upon them. But look at verses 14 and 15. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. That doesn't sound very nice. If the man's doing bad things and God rewards him according to his works, it's going to be a bad reward. It's going to be judgment. He's praying for Alexander to be judged by God. But why? Why is Alexander judged by God in Paul's prayers, but his friends who betrayed him are not? He, prayed, he intercedes for them, not that God won't hold it against them. Well, verse 15 tells us, You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Alexander is resisting the gospel. Alexander is trying to snuff out the message of Christ's kingdom in his town. And Paul sees him as an enemy, of, not of Paul, but of the gospel and of the words that Paul's preaching. So he wishes for God to avenge his own words. It's not Paul who wants people who hurt him to get hurt. He wants people who are opposing Christ to be stopped. And all people will be eventually. Alexander the, the uh, coppersmith would certainly die at any point uh, someday. But Paul apparently is wanting something to happen to him sooner rather than later. So that he would stop resisting the gospel. And uh, no doubt Paul would love it if the man was converted. But if not, he hopes that God will re reward him according to his works. Though, though those who hurt Paul, Paul had no animosity toward. David was the same way. Many of the Psalms that David uh, prayed were wishing evil on people who forsook God's laws, who resisted God, who, uh, you know, who persecuted the righteous, who oppressed the poor. David often wished some very ugly things on them in his Psalms. But when it came to people who were hurting him, like Absalom, or Saul. He had no malice at all toward them. When Absalom tried to kill him and got himself killed, instead, David wept for him. When Saul was trying to kill David and got himself killed, instead, David wept for him. David did not have any malice toward those who were his personal enemies, but when people were opposing God, he was on God's side. And his prayers, not his actions necessarily, but his prayers, were mobilized as weapons against the enemies of the gospel. Notice neither Jesus nor David nor Paul set about to avenge themselves. David had the opportunity to kill Saul twice. Saul was as mercy and David wouldn't do it. And although David did fight the wars of the Lord, the Bible says that. He, I think it was Abigail that said to him that you fight the, the wars of the Lord. 
Well, that, David didn't go out and fight his own wars. He fought God's wars. But when it came to his own personal enemies, he wouldn't kill them. He wouldn't wish them ill. There is, it, it's, it's possible to love your enemies, but be, have very uh, harsh things to pray about those who are God's enemies. Look, look what David said in Psalm 139. Look at 100, Psalm 139, how he prays in verse 19. David says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Not, they speak against me, God. Kill them. No, he says, Lord, slay those wicked, bloodthirsty men, because they're speaking against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. It's not that they're opposing David. They're taking God's name in vain. That's what David can't tolerate. He says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Notice that last line. They aren't my enemies. They're your enemies. But I count them my enemies. I'm on your side. God, if you are at war and they're at war against you, I'm on your side. Uh, they're my enemies if they're your enemies. Now, Notice he's not talking about those who are trying to kill David. There were plenty of people trying to kill David. But those who are taking God's name in vain, those who hated the Lord, those who speak evil, wickedly against God, those are the ones David says, I make them my enemies. I hate them with perfect hatred. There must be a perfect hatred. And likewise, the saints in heaven are praying, Lord, how long before you avenge our blood? There is a legitimacy to praying for God to settle scores. After all, God is concerned about justice. We don't hate our enemies. We better not hate our enemies. or are also not like Christ. But we can certainly wish that the game would be over soon. We can certainly wish that those that are dragging out this resistance to the kingdom of God, that would, they'd be soon removed. They're going to be removed eventually anyway. Why not sooner rather than later? That's really what the attitude seems to be. And if you look at Luke chapter 18, at the beginning... It says, then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Saying, there was a certain, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in the city and she came to him saying, avenge me of my adversary. And he would not do it for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, that's the end of the parable. Jesus now makes the application. Verse 6. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? God's elect cry out day and night for vengeance. And God will avenge them. There is apparently a, a function of, of spiritual warfare and prayer that involves asking God to settle the scores with his enemies. And to get those people who are killing our brothers and sisters off our backs. Now we have to endure until he does so, like the people who were in heaven and said, How long, Lord? He's well, a little longer. Just be patient. There's more martyrs to be made, but when that's done, then the vengeance will be there. God said, he will avenge. Paul said, brethren, do not avenge yourselves, but give place <coughs> to wrath, because God has said, I, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Why? Because someone else is going to avenge you. Give place to wrath. It is written, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. God said he'll avenge. You don't avenge yourself. If that, if that is why we can turn the other cheek. That is why we can do good to those who persecute us. That's why we can bless those who curse us. Because it's not like, um, it, it's not like we're just going to be sitting ducks. And they're going to walk all over us. God will avenge. 
And so Paul says there in Romans 12, verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If your enemy thirsts, give him a drink. You're treating your enemy kindly. That's the Christian thing to do. But in so doing, you heap coals of fire on his head. That is, the judgment is accumulating for him. And so, to pray that God will, in his time, judge the wicked, so that the righteousness can fill the earth. That is, after all, what we are praying for when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, except at the expense of those who resist it? They either have to convert or they have to be mowed down. That's just what God's going to have to do. And we pray for that every time we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray. It's, like I say, a disconcerting aspect of prayer because we don't hold any ill will toward them as people. We would prefer that they be saved and we'd rejoice if they did. But there's this larger campaign between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. And we're on the side of the kingdom of God. And those that are on the side of the kingdom of darkness and want to stop God, well, we're, we mobilize God through our prayers. Now, what we see in Revelation 8 then is these prayers are going up, and from those prayers, there comes judgment down. I believe that we are seeing God answering the prayers of those martyrs again, from another angle. And uh, their prayers have gone up, and the vengeance is coming down from God, not from them. Christians don't avenge themselves. Now, it takes the form of seven trumpet judgments, four of which are in chapter 8. And two are elaborated on at length in chapter 9. So that we get, by the end of chapter 9, we've got six of the seven down. And it says in verse 7, The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the waters and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood, which means bitterness. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon. And a third of the stars saw that the third of them were all darkened. And a third of the day did not shine. And likewise the night. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth or the land because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels that are about to sound. Now, woe, 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 there's one for each of those trumpets. After the next one sounds, we will find, for example, in verse 12 of the next chapter, one woe is past. Behold, still more two woes are coming. So the last three trumpets are three woes. They are more intense than the first four trumpets. But we have the first four here. And it, the trumpets then are a little bit like the seals in this respect. The first four seals were set off from the last three in some way. The first four seals each involved a horseman. The last three didn't. So the first four trumpets are set off from the last three in that the last three are called woes. They apparently are more extremely severe. But with reference to these first four, what are we seeing here? We're seeing, first of all, these trumpets affect a third of everything they affect. Now, a third is not to be understood as a statistic, in my opinion. You'll find that in the Old Testament, a third is sometimes used to simply mean uh, a division of something. Uh, I, I take it to mean a, a significant minority of something. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 5, Ezekiel... Uh, is told that, you know, he, he cuts off his hair, he divides it into three uh, batches, and he treats it differently. Each, each batch is going to be different. He's going to burn some of it, he's going to cut up some of it with a sword, and a third of it he's going to throw into the wind. A literal third? I don't know. He may, I think he actually measured it out to do that with one third. But in verse 12, 
God's describing this is what's going to happen to Jerusalem. He says, one third of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. And one third shall fall by the sword all around you. And I will scatter another third to all the winds and will draw out a sword after them. This is, of course, when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. There, these three different fates met the people there. God talks as if there's a, it's a neat division. A third go here, a third die, a third go into there. And in all likelihood, it just means there's three different categories, and some are in each category, not literally a statistical third, just a portion of them. One third is obviously less than half, and therefore it's a minority. But it's the largest whole fraction, less than a half, so it's not a small minority, it's a significant minority. Over in Zechariah chapter 13, there is a, uh, a prophecy, I believe, about the destruction of Jerusalem and the saving of the remnant from that destruction. And it's talked about this way in Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. It shall come to pass in the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. That is, there will be a surviving third uh, when two-thirds of the people are killed. And I will bring the one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. Like Peter said, the, the, the believers were being tested as fire by fiery trials as gold is tested. They will call on my name. I'll answer them. I'll, I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Now, he's saying in, in the judgment of Jerusalem, he said two-thirds would die and one-third would be preserved as a faithful remnant. I seriously doubt if one-third is an exact uh, fraction of how many people were in the remnant. It's not necessary to think so. This is simply saying the majority will die. A significant minority will be preserved as a remnant. And likewise with Revelation, these visions are very impressionistic. Uh, when people try to make them quite literal, eh, they often go into strange interpretation. Now there are some ways in which there is a literal fulfillment of some of the features, that is to say you can find it. Whether it's intended that way or not is hard to say. When it says in the first trumpet that a third of the trees were burned up and the grass was burned up, some interpreters make the trees and the grass to be people of certain designations. It is possible that this is simply talking about the fact that trees were destroyed in large numbers during the siege of Jerusalem because the Romans needed the wood to build their siege works. They cut down all the trees around there. And, and Josephus tells us that. Now, whether this is talking about that or not is anyone's guess. But just, out, just for your interest, Josephus in his Wars of the Jews in Book 6, Chapter 1, Paragraph 1, Josephus wrote this, And now the Romans, although they were greatly distressed in getting together their materials, raised their banks in one and twenty days, after they had cut down all the trees that were in the country, that had joined to the city, and that for ninety furlongs round about, as I have already re related. And truly the very view itself of the country was a melancholy thing. For those places which once before were adorned with trees and pleasant gardens were now become a desolate country every way, and its trees were all cut down, nor could any foreigner that had formerly seen Judea and the most beautiful suburbs of the city, and now saw it as a desert, but lament and mourn sadly at so great a change, for the war had laid all signs of beauty quite waste, says Josephus. This is when the Romans were besieging the city. All the trees within, what do you say, 90 furlongs of the city were gone. Not all the trees in the whole country were gone. But around the city of Jerusalem, all were gone. So what had been once a garden spot was now waste and desert. It was you know, defoliated. And so this first trumpet that speaks of the burning up of a third of the trees and of the grass might even refer to that. That would be a significant thing. It's not just aesthetics involved. Trees are the life of a community in many cases, especially in the Middle East. In the desert regions, it's really hard to, it takes a long time to grow trees and you need them. So this was a great disaster and it would leave the country in bad shape for years to come. The second angel sounded, verse 8, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. 
A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, again, I don't know to what degree the literal fulfillment of this is to be implied, but there is a rather literal fulfillment of this that Josephus relates. And it's interesting because he's talking in uh, The Wars of the Jews, book 3, chapter 10 and paragraph 9, Josephus is describing a war that happened in Galilee where the Romans chased the Galileans into small boats on the Sea of Galilee and the people fled from the Romans at, uh, at sea. However, the Romans pursued them in small boats, so there's this maritime battle out on the Sea of Galilee. And it went very badly for the Jews. The Romans were just picking them off like sitting ducks, literally. And uh, Josephus relates it in this way. Let me just read what he says about this awful thing. He says, as for such as were drowning in the sea, this is when the Romans were shooting them out of their boats and stuff uh, with arrows. As, as for such as were drowning in the sea, if they lifted their heads up above the water, they were either killed by arrows or caught by the vessels. But if, in the desperate case they were in, they attempted to swim to their enemies, the Romans cut off either their heads or their hands, and indeed they were destroyed after various manners everywhere, till the rest, being put to flight, were forced to get upon land, while the vessels encompassed them about on the sea. But as many of these uh, were repulsed when they were getting ashore, uh, they were killed by the darts or the arrows upon the lake. That is, there were as many killed going ashore as there were killed on the lake. And the Romans leaped out of their vessels and destroyed a great many more upon the land. One might see the lake all bloody and full of dead bodies, for not one of them escaped. And a terrible stink and a very sad sight there on the following days over the country. For as for the shores, they were full of shipwrecks and of dead bodies all swelled. And as the dead bodies were inflamed by the sun and putrefied, they corrupted the air, insomuch that the misery was not only the object of commiseration to the Jews, but to those who hated them and had been the authors of that misery. As it was so ghastly that even the Romans felt awful about it afterwards. Uh, but notice the, the, the Sea of Galilee looked all bloody, and it was, uh, the shore was full of shipwrecks and so forth. In this description, the sea became blood, and, you know, Living creatures in the sea died. The third of the ships were destroyed. This could be actually referring to something like that. Though there's more symbolism than that in this. Because he sees a great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea. What is that about? The sea turns to blood because a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea. Well, mountain being thrown into the sea is an image that Jesus talked about. And it's interesting the connection in which he did. If you look at Mark chapter 11. Verses 20 through 24. Mark eleven twenty says, Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Jesus had cursed it the day before. He said, No one will ever eat fruit from you again. Most commentators believe that the fig tree was a symbol of Israel, unfruitful and therefore given no more opportunity in the future to bear the fruit. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, now I didn't say to a mountain, but this mountain, where was it? They were ascending the slopes of Mount Zion to the city of Jerusalem. He's talking about Jerusalem here. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now in connection with the fig tree being cursed, which was an emblem apparently of the impending judgment on Jerusalem, Jesus gave this little illustration. You could say to this mountain, be cast into the sea. The sea is an emblem for the Gentile world in prophecy. This mountain being Jerusalem. For the population of Jerusalem to be cast into the sea would be for 
them to be dispersed into the Gentile lands. Now, it might not sound like Jesus is saying something very nice here if he's saying that, the, that his disciples should pray for the downfall of Jerusalem. But remember the woman who cried to the judge, avenge me. It, the disciples were persecuted and many of them were killed by the Sanhedrin's orders. And Jerusalem was the persecutor of the church. And like those in heaven who are saying, Lord, how long before you avenge our blood on those who dwell in the land? Jesus assumed that his disciples would be praying for the righting of this wrong. And this right, writing of this wrong would mean this mountain being cast into the sea. Remember, these things in chapter 8 of Revelation are happening because prayers have gone up and judgments have come down in response to those prayers. And now we see a mountain being cast into the sea, a flame. It's on fire. It's under judgment. And it's thrown into the sea. This symbolically seems to be a picture of Jerusalem being uh, fallen and, and the Jews being scattered to the Gentile world. But along with it, we have this seemingly almost literal anecdote of this horrible battle at sea. Maybe one or both of these meanings attach. We can't say for sure. Now, the third trumpet, verse 10, Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star was Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water as it became it was made bitter. Well, no doubt there is some literal truth to this in the, in the war, because, of course, fresh water sources are often polluted by, well, dead bodies. For one thing, Josephus described all those putrefying bodies on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee provided the waters for the Jordan River, moving south from there. There would be, no doubt, many occasions for the water sources to become polluted in such a massive war, in such a small area. But I think this is symbolic too. I mean, there may be literal correspondence, but I believe the, the description is, has symbolic value. The fresh water is turning into bitter water. If you look back at Exodus chapter 15, I believe we'll find perhaps the words that God spoke that are relevant to this. In Exodus chapter 15, right after the Jews came out of it, after Israel came out of Egypt, immediately after the Exodus, they came to a place where they needed water and the water was not drinkable because it was bitter water. And we read about it in Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness, and they found no water. Now when they came to Marah, which is Hebrew for bitter, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it is called Marah. But someone before they got there discovered the water was bitter and called it Marah, or else they named it Marah as a result of having come there. In any case, the place is called Mara because it means bitter, and the water was bitter, not drinkable. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and ordinance for them, and there he tested them, and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Now, this is very important. We have Moses throwing a tree into the waters that are bitter and they become fresh water. They become sweet. In the vision of Revelation 8.10... Something like a burning torch is thrown into the waters, and they, the, the fresh waters turn bitter. There's something of a reversal of this miracle, so to speak. But what is the meaning of the miracle? If we know the meaning of the miracle in Exodus 15, then we can make some sense of the meaning of the curse that comes in the third trumpet. Bitterness is a symbol for the Egyptian bondage. The Jews accept this fact. At Passover, they have bitter herbs on the table. When the child asks, why do we have these bitter herbs? The father is supposed to say, it represents, it reminds us of the bitter bondage we had in Egypt. 
It was a bitter thing to be in bondage for those hundreds of years. And God, by delivering them, healed them like he healed the waters of Marah. He says, I am the Lord your healer. I brought you out of Egypt. Now, your bitter condition has been reversed. You're not in Egypt anymore. You're not slaves anymore. You're, in, you're free. Your bitter waters have turned sweet. And yet he says there's conditions upon this. We saw in Exodus 15, 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. None of the plagues of Egypt would come upon them if they were obedient. What do we see in the book of Revelation? The plagues of Egypt coming on them. Why? Because they didn't keep the covenant. They didn't obey. And it says, for I am the Lord who heals you. God healed their circumstances from being bitter to sweet. He healed the waters of Mara and turned them from bitter to sweet. And the, the change in the waters from bitter to sweet was an emblem of him bringing them out of Egypt and keeping them from the plagues of Egypt. And so he says on this occasion, if you continue to be obedient to me, then I will continue to spare you. I will not bring the plagues, the diseases that I brought onto the Egyptians on you. Now it's very obvious that in Revelation the opposite is happening. The, the plagues of Egypt are coming on them. Because they haven't been obedient. And their fresh water is turning bitter again. It's very symbolic. No doubt, literally, this happened. That probably water did turn bitter and, and, and not potable. And it was dangerous to drink. But the very phenomenon of the water turning bitter again is the reversal of what happened at Mara. And the meaning is the reversal. God had delivered them from Egypt. That was turning the bitter water sweet. Now... He's bringing them back into, uh, well, they, they become in Egypt. They're no longer going to have their sweet waters. They're going to be made bitter again, unfortunately. Then the last of these in verse 12, Revelation 8, 12. Then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened and a third of the day did not shine. And likewise the night. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. We won't take those tonight. But this, this fourth trumpet, like the others, affected a third of everything. And this time it was the luminaries in the sky. Darkened them a third of the time. Some people who try to make this a future tribulation, they say, well, maybe this pollution, it kind of cuts out a third of, this, of the light of the sun when it starts from reaching us. But this is not cutting out a third of the light. It's cutting off all light for a third of the day and all the light for a third of the night. It was a third of the day they didn't shine and a third of the night they didn't shine. So it's, it's not really anything natural. This is symbolic. What's it symbolic of? Well, we've seen in the Old Testament and we've even seen already in Revelation chapter 6, the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars is a representation of disaster, of downfall, of a kingdom. When Babylon fell in Isaiah 13, the sun, moon, and stars went dark, according to Isaiah 13.10. Uh, when Egypt was conquered by Babylon, the sun, moon, and stars were darkened over Egypt, according to uh, Ezekiel 32. When Edom was judged in Isaiah 34, the heavens were rolled up like a scroll. And the stars fell from heaven and the sun was darkened like sackcloth. In other words, the darkening of the sun and the collapse of the cosmos are images used of utter destruction of a, of a nation. This is not the utter destruction. This is partial destruction. The lights are going dim, but so far it's only partway. It's only a third. Now... When we come to the bowls of wrath in chapter 16, the same domains are affected by the bowls, except they turn all the sea to blood, not a third of it. They turn all the waters undrinkable. They, turn, uh, they affect the whole of the cosmos, the whole of everything. Uh, and, and some have said that the difference between the trumpets and the bowls, I mean, the obvious difference is the trumpets affect one third, the bowls affect the whole. 
And some say the significance of that is that the trumpets represent the early stages of judgment, which still allow opportunity to repent. It's like a warning shot. God is doing disastrous things to these people, but they, it's supposed to make them wise up and repent. And we're going to see that after the sixth trumpet sounds at the end of chapter 9. We won't take it, of course, now, but, but at the end of chapter 9, verse 20, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. And in verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. There's, although these things were happening, they didn't <laughs> repent, which sounds like the purpose of these was to induce them to repent, but they didn't. So that these are the preliminary disasters, or what Jesus said, the beginning of birth pangs. These are just the beginning of sorrows. This is not the end yet. But it is a protracted war that had many ugly scenes. And the scenes that are described here are somewhat symbolic. It's like God judging a Canaanite city of Jericho, only now it's Jerusalem. It's like the waters are turning bitter again that were once changed from bitter to sweet for them. It's like the mountain is now on fire being thrown into the sea. Um, it's like the sky is darkening, but it's not all the way dark yet. The disaster is not total, but it's nearing, and therefore it is a warning to those who are surviving that they should repent and uh, it's almost with marvel that John notes at the end of chapter 9, they don't. Why they would not is amazing to imagine. But part of the reason is going to be seen when the fifth trumpet sounds. And we'll have to hold off for next time about that.